All right, in chapter 15 and 16 and 17, we will be covering uh, the immune system and what happens when the immune system goes wrong or breaks down. And uh, a lot of this has to do with humans or generally the host for a pathogen. Um, because of that, there's a lot of extra terminology, a lot of other kind of broader concepts that branch out a little bit into anatomy and physiology. Um, and we really haven't talked much about humans. So instead of doing a test for this section, we will instead do a paper that will take the place of a test. Um, there are uh, two broad branches of the immune system. And in chapter 15, we will start by talking about the innate immune system, which is a very non-specific, um, very basic part of the immune system. And then in chapter 16, we will dive into the specifics of the adaptive immune system, which is uh, more tailored to an individual pathogen and uh, has some advantages, but also some drawbacks to it. In chapter 15, we will at least overview the two different systems, just so that we kind of know, because they are very intertwined, uh, we do talk a little bit about the adaptive immune system in this chapter, but we will really talk about it in detail later. Uh, we'll talk about how microbial structures um, function and uh, kind of activate innate immune mechanisms, um, and how innate immune mechanisms respond to microbes that way. Um, some of the features of the innate immune system that can lead to either acute or chronic inflammation. Inflammation is a very important part of the innate immune system. And then we will talk about uh, how the actual innate immune system itself can lead to some of the symptoms that we experience when we have disease. So uh, symptoms are not just caused by the pathogen. They are also often caused by the body's own response to the pathogen. So we'll talk about that. Let's start with a case study here. Uh, this one is really important to think about um, in terms of what the immune system is actually doing. So we have two tourists who are in uh, Alabama on the Gulf Coast. They're there the same weekend in August. They swim in the same water in the Gulf of Mexico. So one, she's 12 years old, her name's Alexis, and she had a, a cut on her arm when she fell onto the edge of her scooter. The other individual is Brad. He's 66 years old, and he recently cut his leg on a nail that was coming out of his railing on his beach condo. So, both of these people have wounds in their skin. They both go swimming, and within seconds of getting in the water, right, there are a large number, in this case of gram-negative microbes, that invade both of their body through these cuts. But, four days later, our young girl, she is heading back home, and uh, the other individual, Brad, is dead. So four days makes a huge amount of difference in this case. So this case study is really about why is one person perfectly healthy, fine, on their way home, uh, and the other person is dead? Same infection, same scenario. Why did one person die and the other didn't? So let's look at what happened to Brad. Uh, Brad, so he went in uh, and within a day, uh, his leg began to swell. And uh, it was swelling up and it hurt when he touched it. Um, but he put off going to the ER um, until the second day when his leg got extremely painful and started to get dark purple and he began to be feverish here. So uh, this is... You know, the initial part, yeah, you have a cut, your leg is swollen, you know, you don't think much of it. Um, but when you start to see these things, you, you think something um, drastically bad is going on. At the hospital, he came in, he had a fever of 102 and very low blood pressure. Um, so there are symptoms throughout his whole body as well, right? That fever, that low blood pressure, um, as well as the swelling and the pain. So they take samples of the wound material. It's got pus in there and blood, um, and they're sent to the lab to culture it to identify the pathogen. Um, 
unfortunately, sometimes some of our tests take a long time, in this case, 48 hours. Um, so they're going to start him on that empirical antibiotic therapy where they just start giving antibiotics, right? They can notice that it's gram negative. Um, so they'll start a uh, course of antibiotics because if you come in with something like this, uh, they're very, very worried that you might be septicemic. Day three, uh, areas of his legs start turning black and become gangrenous. Uh, gangrene is uh, an infectious uh, bacterial wound. It's caused by many different infections. It's a complicated um, uh, disease, but it leads to swelling um, that spreads up and down. His fever stays high, and he ultimately becomes unconscious and unresponsive. It seems that the antibiotics are not working. On the fourth day, Brad died. And uh, the lab report got completed, but it's too late. Um, so it indicated that his wound and his blood cultures had Vibrio vulnificus uh, in it, which is a common water bacteria. You might notice Vibrio. We had Vibrio cholera previously. So here's the question. Uh, both swimmers in the case uh, were infected with the same pathogen. Uh, the young girl had an infection with Vibrio vulnificus. Um, and Brad had one. Um, why did Alexis live and Brad die? Well, obviously, there's many, many factors to this. But one of them is the immune system. So let's look at some more details here. Uh, Alexis is a healthy young individual with a strong immune system. And uh, particularly, the nonspecific innate immune system. This, as we'll see, is the first line of defense for when pathogens enter the body. Uh, they don't target specific microbes, they just target any microbes that make their way in. So it's like the first line of defense that happens. Brad, on the other hand, he was an alcoholic, he had liver disease, um, and because the liver is super important in these innate immune responses, his immune response was dampened, and that left him vulnerable to this infection. So he was not able to fight off the bacteria the second they got in, and they started to multiply, and that led to his disease here. So the immune system is critical in dealing with the microbes that are all around us. Uh, we've seen in the lab, right? We know there are microbes all around. Why don't we constantly get infected and die from them? The answer is your immune system. So we're going to look first at uh, what is the immune system. We'll distinguish the two parts of it. And then the rest of the chapter will be spent on the innate immune system. Uh, there are a large number of cells that... Uh, are part of this system. So we need to talk about a few cellular processes in humans here. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about white blood cells in this chapter and the next chapter. So let's start by defining what the immune system is. The immune system is a collection of organs, tissues, cells, and cell products that all work together to differentiate self, so host cells, from non-self, invader cells. And they rid the body of those non-self things. Uh, usually it's cells, but there are other things that they can uh, deal with, toxins and things like that as well. So it's a way of identifying yourself versus not yourself. Um, and that's, that's really what the whole purpose of the immune system is. We have two branches of the immune system. We have the innate system. Uh, this consists of a few different things like physical barriers. Your skin is technically part of your innate immune system. Um, we'll talk about these uh, chemical barriers, stuff like the stomach acid in your stomach. That's an innate immune defense, right? Microbes go in, they get destroyed by the stomach acid. And then there are some cells that are involved in this. Uh, again, though, the innate immunity does not recognize specific microbes. It recognizes general patterns of microbes and kind of attacks those. The adaptive immune system, on the other hand, this is very fine-tuned. This is very precise. This recognizes specific pathogens, attacks them, and builds a memory of those specific pathogens. So we have... Uh, Active immunity, uh, you can get this 
whenever you get sick, right, your body builds immune defenses against that, and hopefully you don't get the same sickness again. Um, or you can build that through vaccination, right? Uh, you can expose yourself to little pieces of the pathogen and your immune system will recognize those pieces called antigens and start building defenses and memory to them. That memory is critical because the next time you encounter the pathogen, your immune system attacks it much faster, your adaptive system. There are other types of immunity, passive immunity. Uh, babies, they don't get... Uh, their immune system is still developing. So they can receive several types of immune molecules like antibodies through breastfeeding. Also uh, in the womb, some of the mother's uh, antibodies and things are transferred to uh, the fetus. And then there are artificial means to inject antibodies. Uh, you probably heard of monoclonal antibody therapy that is taking antibodies from healthy individuals and injecting them into people who are sick. Um, although we haven't seen a great deal of success with this, it is theoretically possible. So let's really codify what, what these two systems are. Okay, the innate system. This, think of it as your first line of defense here. Uh, it's an immediate response. It starts right away. But it is not specific to just one pathogen. It doesn't recognize, um, I don't know, E. coli and go, hey, that's E. coli. I've, I've seen you before, right? Like it just goes, microbe is in the body. Attack. Your innate immunity is actually present before birth. So it's there with you all the time. And it is always on, okay? So from the time that an infection starts through its incubation period all the way until an infection ends, it is constantly working. The other side, the adaptive side, again, this is where our vaccination functions, um, this is very specific to its target. But because of that specificity, it is slower to get going. It can take up to a week for this to really get ramped up. And this is one of the reasons that in our case study, Brad did not survive. His adaptive immune system was not quick enough to catch up with his infection. And because he was compromised in the innate immune system, he was not able to deal with those microbes and they infected him and started growing. The adaptive system though needs to see, I say see, um, we'll talk about what that means, the antigen first. So an antigen is a small molecule um, that has a specific shape that the adaptive immune system recognizes. So that might be like the spike protein on our, our SARS-CoV-2 virus or something like that. Uh, the great part about the adaptive system is that once it sees an antigen, it builds memory of it. And that memory lasts for a long period of time, years, uh, even possibly your entire life that memory helps us respond faster to the same uh, pathogen the second time we see it. That is why we give booster doses of vaccines because um, they can ramp and build up our immunity so that when you encounter the pathogen itself, your immune system is already primed and ready to go, your adaptive immune system. So we will come back to the adaptive system. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it. There's a few cells that overlap, but we'll talk more in detail in the next chapter. We're gonna focus on the innate system first. So I wanna remind you uh, about this diagram that we had, it seems like forever ago, about the stages of an infection. Remember an infection is when a microbe gets into the human body and starts to replicate. So there's an initial phase, the incubation phase. This is very short. Uh, the microbe gets in. And we're looking both at the number of microbes and the level of immune response here. This is primarily, uh, the immune response here is primarily the adaptive system. So we have a little bit of immune response at all times. That's our innate immune system. Uh, if it is unable to deal with the microbe, then it progresses to this prodromal phase where um, uh, it starts replicating. And once symptoms start, we call this the illness phase. And that's when microbial growth really starts in earnest. You can see the immune response is lagging behind. Um, hopefully, at some point, the immune system, the adaptive system kicks in and starts decreasing the number of microbes that are in here. If the adaptive system 
does not have time to kick in or is unable to for some reason, uh, this part here could lead to death ultimately. So we're in an example where the patient does not die from the infection. Uh, here, the decline phase, right? The immune system has ramped up and you can see this immune system stays up for a long time, even as the number of microbes drops dramatically. And it will stay at a higher level uh, for, for a long period of time. How long depends on various factors, what the antigen was, all these things. So um, I can't tell you uh, a definite number. It, it varies case by case and person by person. So, um, of course, this uh, immunity is recognizing a pathogen. Pathogens can evolve, as we'll see. So they can evolve to get around that immune response. Okay, if you need the... The super basic but very uh, evocative uh, kind of analogy here. Um, we have things like a moat, and we could put alligators in our moat. Um, these are like our innate, non specific immune system protections, right? Um, yes, they will stop the invaders, but they will probably also stop us if we try to get out, right? So, um, they, they don't really recognize anything that is act on certain things. We also have specific uh, innate defenses. Um, again, they don't really recognize, but they will attack pathogens. Then we have really targeted things like antibodies. The antibodies, we can pick out an individual microbe to target and specifically hit them. And we'll see that B cells make those. Okay, so this is a bit labored of a metaphor, right? But uh, I hope it helps you kind of understand the, what I mean by specific and non-specific. When we talk about the immune system, we're going to talk a lot about white blood cells. Um, you might not think about this, but there are actually many different types of white blood cells. So here we have red blood cells, and then everything else in here uh, pretty much is a type of white blood cell. So they look very different and they're gonna act slightly different, but we will see how they all come to be. So uh, different white blood cells have different jobs. Um, we have things like polymorphonuclear leukocytes, uh, PMNs. We'll talk about what those are. Uh, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, and mast cells. These are all types of white blood cells. And we'll talk a little bit about what each does. Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, macrophages and a type of PMN called neutrophils. But first, we need to talk about a process called differentiation. Um, this is something that eukaryotes tend to do, at least multicellular eukaryotes, whereas bacteria really don't do it. We've only seen this when we saw spore-forming bacteria. You start as a single cell, right? Sperm and egg fuse to create the zygote. So you are a single cell at that point but you develop into a complex organism with all kinds of different tissues and cell types, right? You got skin, eyeballs, brain cells, hair, right? I, I don't know, liver, heart, all these different things, muscle cells. This happens through a process called differentiation, which is we have things called stem cells. These are undifferentiated cells that can become different types of cells through special divisions called differentiation. You can have cells, uh, muscle cells, fat cells, bone cells, blood cells, nerve cells, epithelial, immune, immune cells. That's the one we're going to talk most about. And we're going to look at this diagram several times. Um, it doesn't make sense right now, probably, but it will. So uh, differentiation of blood cells. So we're talking about different types of blood cells. Uh, we have red blood cells, uh, white blood cells, and actually white blood cells are grouped into two broad different groups, uh, at least the way they differentiate. These all get made in the bone marrow in hemopoietic stem cells. So hematopoiesis is the process of making blood cells, of differentiating into blood cells. So there are stem cells in your bone marrow that differentiate into these different types of cells. So we up here have our precursor stem cell. So this is our hemopoietic uh, uh, cell from our bone marrow. It could develop into an erythroid stem cell, which could become a red blood cell or a megakaryoblast, which becomes a blood platelet. 
Okay, that's a separate branch that we're not going to talk about. Uh, red blood cells have a very specific purpose, carrying oxygen, uh, but they're not really involved in the uh, immune response. We're going to talk about these two other branches. And luckily, we can think of these branches as being things that are really involved in the innate immune system and things that are involved in the adaptive immune system. So we will come back to T cells and B cells, and we're not really gonna talk about these natural killer cells. They're a side branch that's too, too detailed for us, but these are all called lymphoid stem cells. Uh, they are broadly called lymphocytes, and they're involved in the adaptive system. So we already talked about T cells when we talked about HIV. The other group, the myeloid stem cells, which can become uh, mast cells, which are their own branch, uh, myeloblasts, which become eosinophils, basophils, but importantly, neutrophils. These are all what we call PMNs, uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. That means they have many nuclei in them. These are very important. Neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cells in the blood. The other branch, the monoblasts, become monocytes, and they can become macrophages or dendritic cells. These are both really important in phagocytosing and engulfing invading pathogens and destroying them. But they do a few other things as well. Okay, so if we, if we break these down into what processes they're involved in, right, a lot of these are involved in the innate immune system. We have some that bridge the gap between them. Uh, but then the B and T cells are primarily involved in the adaptive system. So B cells are really important in making antibodies and T cells will attack infected cells. Okay, we're going to focus on these cells. We'll come back to these in the next chapter. So let's start with the PMNs, the polymorphonuclear leukocytes. That name, it's terrible, I know. Uh, it means that they have multiple nuclei, and in there they have lots of lysosomes in their cell. The main cell type here are the neutrophils. These make up uh, almost all of our white blood cells. Uh, they can engulf microbes by phagocytosis, and then they combine them with the lysosomes to break down the bacteria. Uh, Dead neutrophils are the white material that forms pus. So uh, pus is the byproduct of killing microbes. Basophils, eosinophils, um, these uh, do phagocytosis, but less efficiently than neutrophils. Um, they also release products that are toxic to microbes. And they're really critical because they make vasoactive chemical mediators, which are important for inflammation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But vasoactive means they help uh, uh, dilate blood vessels and allow these cells to get out into tissues. We'll come back to that. Okay, so that's the PMNs. That's this lineage here. Mast cells are kind of on their own. Uh, they have granules of histamine and heparin, which help um, kind of kick off the innate immune responses, things like uh, fever and inflammation that are occurring. Uh, they primarily reside in connective tissues, mucosa. They don't circulate through the bloodstream like the uh, PMNs do, uh, like we saw. They're also important in um, antibody recognition, and they play a role in some allergic responses, so I mentioned them. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about them other than just to mention that they exist. So mast cells off on their own. So our final group are the monoblasts. So these monocytes circulate in the blood, waiting, and they can differentiate into two types of cells, macrophages and dendritic cells, which have all these little branches on them. That's why they're called dendritic cells. Um, dendrites mean branch. Um, so uh, macrophages are distributed widely through the body, and these are one of the big important cells that engulf invading microbes. You can see this macrophage is engulfing bacteria here, and they engulf and kill those bacteria, but they also do a very critical thing. They will take antigens which are little molecules from the pathogen that uh, that the adaptive immune system will recognize. So the macrophages are called antigen-presenting cells because they will take those little molecules and put them on the surface of their cell 
and take them to the T cells and show them to them to train our immune system. They say, hey, this thing is invading us. Uh, you need to start making a response to it. So this purpose of being an antigen presenting cell is very critical for the macrophages as well as the dendritic cells, which do the similar thing, but they're primarily located in the spleen and the lymph nodes. Uh, they, they act pretty similar, but they have very different uh, structure and location. Okay, so uh, these are super critical. We will come back to them again um, in the adaptive system because of this antigen presenting part of it. Okay, so we've talked about phagocytosis previously, but I just wanna review it uh, to make sure that we have this down. So phagocytosis is engulfing invading cells and particles and then fusing them with a lysosome to break them down. So we have some sort of bacteria here, and this is like, uh, I don't know, a macrophage. It will engulf the uh, bacteria. It forms a phagosome, which fuses with a lysosome, which has all kinds of toxic chemicals in it. Those chemicals break down the microbe, and then we release the pieces. But a macrophage actually keeps some of these microbial pieces, sticks them on the outside, and shows them to the adaptive immune system. So let's watch an animation of this. Several types of cells in the immune system, neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells, can engulf microbes by a process called phagocytosis. Here a bacterium binds to the surface of a phagocytic cell. The phagocyte extends pseudopods that engulf the bacterium. The bacterium becomes trapped inside a vesicle, called a phagosome, inside the cell. A lysosome, which is a vesicle filled with digestive enzymes, fuses with the phagosome. Inside the resulting phagolysosome, enzymes destroy various components of the microbe, and ultimately, the microbe itself. The cell releases the microbial debris outside the cell. All right, so we've talked about these white blood cells. Uh, something of interest, we're not gonna go too deep into this, but something to be noted is that uh, different amounts of white blood cells and different counts of white blood cells can actually help us identify and diagnose different types of disease. There is a piece of machinery that we haven't really talked about too much called a flow cytometer. It's basically a fancy equipment to sort cells. Uh, it can count different types of white blood cells. You can get a total number of white blood cells in a sample or uh, differentiate the different types that are in there. So if we look at this table here, uh, we find normally neutrophils make up a large amount of our uh, white blood cells. We have the lymphocytes. These are the T and B cells uh, of the adaptive system. Monocytes, those are our macrophages. Dendritic cells are the remainder there. And then there's some other ones in there. If we have elevated levels of white blood cells, uh, that generally in indicates that some sort of infection is occurring or an allergy. Uh, when we see like eosinophils and basophils uh, at high numbers, that generally indicates that there's an allergic response there. Uh, something like increased neutrophils can be indicative of bacterial infection. Uh, in viral infections, neutrophils can be reduced while lymphocytes are increased, things like this. So we can look at these numbers um, and uh, see what's going on in the body and start to make conclusions about this. Um, so we use these numbers to try and figure out why someone is sick. All right, I said we're gonna touch a little bit on the adaptive system. Um, I, I've mentioned some of these pieces, so I just wanna throw it out there right now. We do have a whole system in our body uh, that deals with uh, making these white blood cells and moving them around the body. Um, some are in the blood, but there's also a lymphatic system, which is kind of a series of tubes that moves around lymphatic cells. Um, part of the uh, lymphatic system uh, is the thymus. Um, that's really important. Um, and thymus is really important in making T cells. The bone marrow is really important in making B cells. Um, these cells kind of move around through the lymphatic system, whereas the innate immune cells tend to move around through the blood um, or are distributed through tissues. There are a lot of secondary organs uh, 
lymph nodes, the spleen, these things called Peyer's patches that we will actually talk about, your tonsils, um, the appendix potentially, um, things like this. So uh, these are all critical pieces of the immune system. They're intertwined between the two systems here. Okay, so the immune system consists of two parts, the innate, which is rapid but non-specific, and the adaptive, which is much slower but very specific to a pathogen. It kills it very well because of that. Um, they are both recognizing and killing pathogens. The innate system has physical barriers that we'll talk about, chemical barriers, um, some cellular responses in here. The adaptive system, on the other hand, is a cellular response that recognizes specific structures called antigens. It makes a memory of those after it's seen them. And that memory allows rapid re-response if you're re-exposed to it. We had a large number of different white blood cells that were important here. They differentiate into the different types of cells. Um, for the innate system, the phagocytic PMNs, uh, monocytes in there, um, that includes antigen presenting macrophages and dendritic cells. They also do phagocytosis, but they show those antigens to the adaptive system. Then we have mast cells off to the side. Uh, we have another set of stem cells that differentiate into these natural killer cells. Uh, they're kind of part of the innate immune system, but kind of not. Uh, we're not going to get into the details of them. And then the other side, the lymphocytes, uh, these are the T cells and the B cells. B cells are important for antibodies. T cells will uh, kill infected cells and help regulate adaptive immunity as a whole. So we'll come back to those in the next chapter. All right, that's it for 15.1.